This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its eighth year of talk like you've never heard it before. Hey everybody, this is the uh, Ramble, yeah, and I'm Alex, and we're here until midnight tonight. Ladies ladies and gentlemen, uh, guess who's here? Larry Bubbles Brown, hello Larry. Yes, uh, right in the middle of our uh, flooding and... uh Got a, we've had two weeks of rain here, pretty much nonstop. It's pretty terrible out there in California, huh? Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. First, it was a, the only place where you can have a drought and a flood at the same time, apparently. So. <laughs> By the way, let me just, uh, for a moment, let me uh, uh, say that you may hear some tapping occasionally. They're working outside my right outside my window, drilling and tapping, because they've been doing what's called pointing. In this building, I don't know if we did we do pointing out in California. I never heard of it. Yeah, um, uh, pointing is when they go to you have a brick building, and then the the uh, about every I don't know how many years I think this is the first time they've probably done it in a hundred years. They go and they remove all the stuff between the bricks and put in new stuff. Okay. Wow, that sounds tedious. Oh, these guys! I if they're on these uh, scaffoldings that go up, you know these these, uh, they're on a platform that goes up, and they're up there all day with each other, and they had an area that's smaller than the long one, so they have a really short scaffold. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's called scaffolding or if it's called uh, you know whatever, but it it it's smaller, and only one guy can fit on it, and I feel sorry for him because he has to be all by himself all day. You know, <laughs> but this is a big deal. They have to do this uh, uh, by law. I don't know if they've done it before in this building, uh, but I can't imagine because they went for so many years being a slum that I don't. I think they probably got away with not having to do it. You know, so. probably. Yeah. I did finally see a picture of your building. It's huge. Oh, it's one. It's wonderful. Oh, you've looked it up. Okay. Yeah. Must have had a slow time getting to it, but you know, uh, yeah, that's our building. It's uh, it's a it's a wonderful building. You know, I keep dreaming if I won the billion dollar lottery, I'd buy this apartment house. You know, and then I'd fix it up and I'd get it back to its old glory. Yeah. Well, it's uh, so that was built for rich people to begin with, right? Built built for very rich people. The idea was that it was, instead of buying a mansion, you bought a mansion in a building, and these were just mansions on top of each other. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So they were very expensive apartments. And ours, which is, uh, uh, what do we got? We got three bedrooms, we got a dining room, we got a, a living room, we got a big foyer that's probably bigger than your apartment. Um and then we've got two bathrooms and we uh, everything like that. That's just our apartment. At the end of the hallway, you can see where there used to be a doorway. And it goes out to another apartment about the same size. So this thing was huge, just huge. But, uh, you know, in the last many years, it's been cut down to where it was in two halves. So that's, that's it. But you still got a lot of room. Oh, God. 2,500 square feet. That's bigger than a lot of houses. And you know the other story about it, don't you, when I'm paying for it? Uh, it's really, I forgot, it's, I think it's a better deal than I've got. <laughs> uh, well, what happened was they, they, they appealed the verdict, okay, from the judge to the appeals court, to the appellate court, and the appellate court turned it down and said, no, it stays the same. So now our rental here in this 2,500 square foot apartment in New York City is $500 a month. Oh my God. (laughs) 
because they rolled the they rolled the uh, the um, um, uh, the rent back to what it was in two thousand three. Okay, and so that's that's uh, that's our story, and we're sticking to it. I mean, I can tell the story because if if you want to, you could probably go and you know go to the courthouse and find the case and find out how it turned out. You know, so it's it's well, public knowledge. You know, so. you might have the best deal in New York. I think we do actually. I, I can't Jesus, think. Of, I can't incredible. imagine. Incredible. Yeah, I, unless there's you know. Somebody was grandfathered into something, you know, but I can't even imagine it being at $500, you know, so. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so we, we you know, we, we, but they're doing this building and it, it, yeah, it's just a mess, just a mess. And it's been this way for three years now, you know. I mean, they did the outside of the apartment house. Now they're doing the courtyard because we have, a, I don't know if you saw, could tell by the picture, but we have a courtyard in the middle. Okay, do you have a garage? No. So you couldn't have a car there. No, but there is there is place for a garage. They just never turned it into a garage. Oh, okay. You know, it, down in the in the basement are the stables where the horses were kept. Wow, <laughs> they're, they're still there, the stables. And what would happen was, is they would keep the horses down there in the carriages. And then they would bring them up, and you, they would come around the courtyard, and people would get into their carriages and go wherever they were going. Well, that was in 1900 when the building was finished. Um, but, you know, it, it, you can't get a car in there now. They, they, they were doing a TV show in which this was an apartment building in Russia called Pan Am. And uh, they showed the... They put a car, they put an old Russian car in the, in the courtyard, but it could barely fit because it was meant for carriages and horses. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's a kind of, kind of a, I mean, I love the building. It's so historic, and, and uh, it, it's wonderful. It's just wonderful. There must have been some famous people that live there. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I would imagine. I haven't I haven't seen anything on people who lived here. Uh, this was built, you know, by the Astors, this apartment building. Okay. And um, then there was another building built by the same architect that is over on the west side, on Broadway, called the Anthorp. And the Anthorp, this is eight floors. The Anthorp is twelve, but it's if you look at it, it's pretty much the same identical building. And uh, it, it uh, it's a, a, a storied, very famous building. But this one was first. This was the, this was the brother. That was the sister. You know, so it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool history, and um, you know, and then uh, Caddy cornered us. This is this is the b best part. Caddy cornered to us on the other corner. Um, is a what is a church now? Big church. And what it was, was it was the first movie palace in America. Uh, wow. it, it was, uh, you ever heard of the name Roxy? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Roxy was a guy who built theaters and so on and so forth. And uh, he took this movie house, which was about two years old that nobody was going to, and turned it into a movie palace. And it was his first movie palace. Later on, he went to, you know, build other movie palaces. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just such an incredible neighborhood. As a matter of fact, we're Harlem here, but Harlem didn't end it up on 125th Street. It didn't move down here till a few years later. Up until that time, this was, I can't remember what, it, maybe it was called Spanish Harlem or something down here. I don't know, but it wasn't Harlem. But it is now, very much so, you know. Uh, and we uh, we're a block up from Malcolm X Boulevard, <laughs> and we live on Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard, which we call Seventh Avenue because we don't want to have to put that on our mail, you know. Adam Clayton Jr. Adam Clayton Jr. Powell Jr. Whatever Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard is a is a mouthful, okay. So, well, uh, he was a uh, I remember and. Uh, 
junior high. He was in the news a lot. He was a very controversial uh, representative. Yes, and he was pretty much a crook. But we named a, an office building after him that's at the end of this street, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard. You know, and I hate living on Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard. Now, I, I, Malcolm X was a, I mean, I was a big fan of Malcolm X. I, I wish we lived on Malcolm X Boulevard, but unfortunately the properties aren't as good down there. So, you know. <laughs> Too many black people down there, you know. Bill Burr does this bit about going up to see, he had a black girlfriend who's going up to see her late one night and he's, gets off and he said yeah, the streets are named after black heroes he said it's two in the morning up the corner of malcolm x and danny glover <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny that's funny uh yeah. yeah no but i mean you know malcolm x jr boulevard which uh, was Lennox. It's still people still call it Lennox. It, they what they do is uh, they have the name still kind of Lennox up there, but then Malcolm uh, uh, Malcolm X Boulevard, you know. But it only goes for a certain amount below Central Park at Seventh Avenue. It's you know. So they they gave the these are honorific names they give out. Yeah, and I think uh, Malcolm X. I think wasn't he wasn't he killed by our government? <laughs> No, no, he was actually killed by, I believe, I mean, you know, but it's believed that he was killed by the Nation of Islam, that he was killed by Elijah Muhammad and his minions, you know, who wanted him dead because he was telling a lot of the stories about, uh, about um, Elijah Muhammad, the, not the least of which was how many mistresses he had and illegitimate children. So, you know, Interesting guy. Yeah. I mean, uh, he was an interesting guy because what he is, I often felt, see, I, I'm, uh, and when we're recording this, it's, it's uh, Martin Luther King Day. And, That's right. And, and the thing I've often said is it always bothered me because I never was a big fan of Malcolm X. I was a big fan of, I mean, a big fan of uh, Martin Luther King. I was a f fan of Malcolm X, and the reason I was a fan of Malcolm X was because he was the best example of how you can change your opinion you know i mean he was a guy that you know the white man is the devil and all of that and he went to um, mecca made a pilgrimage to mecca because all muslims should in their lifetime and he said he saw white people praying with black people and he saw the possibility that we could all get along and uh, you know and uh, uh he started preaching that there was a way we could we could exist within the white world as well, uh, but still maintain our identity, their identity, and so on and so forth. And I thought he was, and he'd been in jail, and uh, he had uh, made himself into a, a religious guy, and uh, uh, you know he went through this whole metamorphosis. It was a better example to uh, young black kids. Then Malcolm X, who they, how can you relate to a guy that was a preacher for crying out loud, you know? And Malcolm X also compromised a lot with whites in order to get what he wanted. And you say, well, you got to have compromise. No, on things like this, you don't compromise. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. You know, there's no compromise on human rights. Come on. You either have human rights or you don't have human rights. Right. And they should be equal for everybody. So, anyway, enough of my... Enough <laughs> and of my, if you believe that, then you get killed. <laughs> enough of my Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> ramp, rant for today, for this year. I do it every year about this time. Uh, but anyway, so listen, I, the re, we're, we're doing this on a Monday. We, we usually do two of them at a time. We do it on a Monday, on a, on a Tuesday usually, but we're doing it on a Monday today because you said you had... Your hernia operation tomorrow, is that still on? Tomorrow, that is scheduled, yes. How are you going to do it? Well, I'm starting to freak out again. I felt pretty confident last Friday, and now, I, now I'm getting really wigged out. So we, we shall see. Look, what you do is if you really need it and you're really in pain from it, then you should do it, you know? Um, uh, it... it, it, it it, yes, it may cause you a certain amount of distress for about a month or so after the operation, and just 
having to, you know, have it heal itself. But once it's healed, it's going to be like he never had a hernia. That would be nice. You know, but I mean, it, nobody's going nobody's going to tell you this is easy. This is considered not a, a difficult operation. Just the the uh, recovery period is longer. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm afraid of. And uh, yeah, yeah. So if I do if I do cancel for the fourth time, what's going to happen? <laughs> uh, the the doctor's going to come out to your house and shoot you. That's what I'm afraid. Yeah, I'll be kidnapped by the uh, <laughs> secret police. Well, they're sitting there looking at their watch right now, saying, "I wonder when um, when uh, uh, Bubbles <laughs> is going to call, uh, trying to cancel his appointment." No, I mean there are things like that you just got to do. You know, I mean, like when I had the prostate cancer, what else could I do? I had to do it. You know. Uh, but and what I but what I went through really didn't have a large recovery thing going for yeah you got through that pretty quickly right well it, it, it didn't have a it, you know it, it did i did go through several stages of the prostate adjusting to what had been been done to it because originally i had radiation and then this doctor comes along and he does the important part of it which is the uh, seeds and implanting the seeds in me so he implanted the seeds in me and, you know, I mean, uh, there were various levels of how much I felt like I had to pee and not pee and do things like that, you know, but it wasn't, it, I didn't have pain after the fact. You know, there was nothing after the fact. Okay. With you, there's probably going to be a healing period, you know. But I don't know, maybe better now, because they're doing laparoscopic surgery. Is that what they're doing with you? Uh, it's Kaiser, so of course not. That oh, well, then they, what they're doing is they... they Take a, they take a mallet and hit you over the head to put you out, and then they and cut. Them, and then they cut you open with an exacto knife. And then they put a couple of leeches on you and send you home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, uh, it's probably laparoscopic these days. So if it is, it's easier. Yeah. But you know, it, it'll take the healing period will take you about. I I've heard about a month. But it's not terrible, you know. You may be in pain for a couple of days, which I hope you are, because I hate you and I want to see you in pain. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, but I mean, uh, you know, I, I think, for instance, we'll have to we'll be talking with each other probably scheduled for another two weeks from now, and I think by then you'll say, "Oh, it's okay for me to do it, one of those things without." Yeah, well, <laughs> either that or I, I canceled again. So. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's what I'll get from you. I cancel again. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't blame you for being. You know, what's the word we're looking for here? Uh, worried yeah. about the about the operation. Yeah, just my. I think I my life is kind of a rut. But uh, when I get out of that rut, it uh, is very distressing. So, your life is a rut. But once you get yeah. out of the rut. Yeah, you don't. You don't. Don't, don't like change. No. So. You don't like. Oh, well, who does? I don't. You know. They always say change is good. I never. I don't think it change is. Change is never good. Change is never no. good. Yeah, it's, change is really good for you. Yeah, right. Screw you. You you go live with change. You know. But I mean, I I, I just find it amazing that uh, you know that uh, that you know you you've got to go through it. You just got to go through it. You got to do it. And uh, once it's done, it's done. You know, you not don't have to keep worrying about it. And, you, and you're in pain, right? How much pain are you in? Today's good. Uh, Saturday was really bad. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I have a hernia, but it doesn't hurt me. Occasionally, it'll act up a little bit. You know, once in a great while. But it doesn't hurt me. I, I'm waiting for it to start hurting me and me going, i got to have a hernia operation. And at my age, who wants to have a hernia operation? Yeah, you're in good shape, so you don't need it. Well, it isn't a matter that I'm in good shape. But, you know, at my age, they don't even like putting you out. You know, like when I had my seeds done, they wouldn't put me out. They said, you're, really? we, don't put wow. you, we don't want to take the chance of putting you out. Okay. So we're, we're giving you a spinal. So they gave me a spinal. Ugh. Which I thought would hurt, and it didn't. But then afterwards, the strange thing about getting a spinal, I have a friend named Patrick, and he's a paraplegic, okay? And after I had that spinal, 
I woke, uh, you know, I, I, they, they give me a bunch of drugs to kind of make me in woozy land, but not put me out, okay? And, uh, and the horrible thing there is you can hear all the people in the room talking. And, <laughs> and, and you think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be like on every drama you've ever seen in a medical procedure, you know? Uh, sutures, scalpel, uh, would you wipe my brow, nurse, please? <laughs> no, it's, here's what you hear. So what are you doing this weekend? Oh, I don't know. I'm going down to the shore. Uh, really, you like going down there? Yeah, it's pretty good. I had a good time. Uh, Talking about their golf game. <laughs> golf game, whatever. And I'm going, God, they're not talking. You know, come on, work on me. You know, the guy's working on me, but he's still talking about other stuff. So, uh, and then I, 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 they take me down to recovery. The recovery took three hours because they couldn't let me go, obviously, until I could feel something, until I could walk, all right? And I have no feeling below my waist. And I know, all of a sudden, I said, I know what Patrick goes through every day of his life. Boy, that would scare the hell out of me. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you suddenly feel that you can't, you can't move your legs, you can't feel your legs, all right, or anything below your waist. Even that special part of you that's below your waist is numb. It's gone. It's dead. You so know. how do I, how do you recover from that? You just lie there till you get better. Till you till till you it wears off. You know. And um, you know, I and I had a nurse who was like a Nazi. And she kept saying, "You can't leave until you can pee up to here in this bag." I'm going. <laughs> Oh, boy. I mean, I have to pee all the way up there in this bag, right? Yeah, that's what you got to do. You know, and I'm going, uh, I'll try. And every time I would go, I finally could get up and walk to the bathroom. It was difficult, but I could walk. And I would go to the bathroom, and I would try peeing, and only a little bit would come out, and i go back, and i show it to her. And she goes, got to have more. Got to be up to this level. And I'm looking at the level I got to get it up to, and uh, you know, give me more water. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and finally, I didn't even get it up to that level. Finally, she got so sick of me, and she said, "Get the hell out of here," you know. <laughs> really? Well, yeah, because I was a pain in the ass. I was really grouchy and nasty and mean. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't want, I want out of here. I just want to go, you know, because other people who had been operated on before uh, after me were leaving cuz they got put out and all they needed to do was just come out of the out of the drowsy stuff you know um and and so i i was i was really i was, oh god she must have hated me i think I'm sure, yeah. i think she did you know i think she kept like emptying my bag a little bit every time i brought it back just so i <laughs> couldn't couldn't leave See if she wrote anything in your medical record. Yeah, yeah, it'll follow me around for the rest of my life. Exactly. It, what was that old thing they did on Seinfeld where Elaine goes to a doctor and she yeah, complains and she kept about trying to get it erased and, uh, kept... uh, and, and he just writes something out. What are you writing down? Nothing. He yeah. wouldn't say anything to her. <laughs> And the whole episode was about her trying to get her her file and get it erased and steal her file and yeah, you know because oh I see here that you were really nasty to a doctor back in 1957. You know I well, I don't I give up. You know how old were you in 1957? You weren't even born yet, were you? No, I was like six, or mm. five. Oh okay. Well then I don't feel so old. Yeah. You know. 1957, our last good year. <laughs> Listen, I'm, you know what I'm going to do here is I'm going to wish you all, all the best for your, uh, you know, your little uh, procedure tomorrow. But when we talk to you next, it will simply be a few minutes later. But to everybody else, it will be after your procedure. Right. So, so, uh, so we should pretend in the next one that you had the operation. Whether I did or not. <laughs> whether, whether you did or not. And and just pretend that, you know, hey, uh, Bubbles, uh, you know, you, how you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling terrific, you know. Or you can say, I'm feeling terrible. Or uh, I almost died on the operating table. <laughs> God. God, wouldn't that be terrible to go in for an operation and die? 
because you know that's the last thing you expect to happen. Yeah, so it uh, happened to a friend of mine, a comic. So. Really? Which Jimmy Jimmy Gunn. Really? Yeah. What he went uh, went in for a, just a what a minor operation? He'd had a series of medical problems, and I think there was some obstruction or something, and yeah, he didn't make it off the table. So. Oh, jeez. You know, well, you know, I guess uh, I guess maybe that's a good way to go. You don't know you're gone. You that's know. what someone said. That's actually a good way to go because you're totally unaware. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, well, I'll, we'll talk about this next time. But I've, okay. heard, I've heard what it's like after you die. But I'll, I'll tell you afterwards or okay. next time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's Larry Bubbles Brown. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll find out about his procedure. Oh, probably yes, we will. a month from now, actually. So anyway. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, Alex. This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its eighth year of talk like you've never heard it before. Our old friend Larry Bubbles Brown. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we, you know, these are the people we love talking to. In fact, I'm gonna, I, I, ta I was sitting here doing some stuff because I've been having problems with my backup on my machine here, not doing what it was supposed to do. And I'm sitting here working with it and blah, 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 and um, uh, never did fix it. Uh, but uh, all of a sudden, I see I'm getting a, a, a FaceTime call from Will Durst. We were talking about Will last night, right? He asked me how he was doing, and I said I didn't know because I kept trying to get a hold of him, and I couldn't get a hold of him. But he finally he just called me. So I was we had a nice little talk today, and I'm going to do a an interview with him tomorrow, and we'll have that on the air probably, hopefully, next week. If he remembers to call me, this is a problem. Because, you know, the guy had a stroke, so I don't expect uh, too much out of him. Uh, uh, and if he does call, then I consider it uh, a good deal, okay? It's a, it's a mitzvah. It's a good day. Uh, let me see here. Anything else? Nah, nothing, nothing. I got, I got, I got nothing, okay? Is that what they say? I got nothing. Um, but anyway, let's admit some people here to the show. And this time I'm going to remember to put the Zoom page on. And you can see them all coming in right now. There's, uh, there's uh, Jeff, and there's Charlie, and there's Vernon, and there's uh, our old friend uh, Josh, and uh, the uh, lovely and attractive Brian Neary. Hello, Brian. Hello. <laughs> oh, that was, ex <laughs> that, was that was exciting. That's good you heard from Durst. That's a... Uh... Uh, my friend who watches the show is asking about him. So that's good. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, 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 I, I'm, I'm supposed to do this interview with him tomorrow. Now. Let's see if it happens, you know. Uh, mm. But, you know, he's supposed to, because the trouble with Zoom, the biggest problem with Zoom, as you know, is you have to call me. I can't call you with Zoom. And so I have to give him the Zoom address and all that, and then he has to call me at the appointed time, and I sit here with fingers crossed and, I've set everything up and I'm ready to go and then I don't hear from him, you know, so, mm. you know, that happens, but, uh, mm. Mm. anyway, how are you guys doing tonight? Okay. Hip top. Uh, have, did you start work this week, Josh? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. Because we hadn't heard from you during the week. Mm. So I figured it had started. How is it? No, yeah, so far so good. That's like what the guy said when he was falling out of the building. <laughs> he got to the 13th floor and somebody said how's it going he said so far so good you know right <laughs> so uh, but uh, no it's good to, it's good to hear that you're at least you know because when you try when you leave one job you go to another one you're hoping that it's everything you hope for it to be or at least yeah. not as miserable as the last job so you know yeah i've had i've had uh, some workers go to Tesla from our company when our company was growing and then Tesla started opening up really big. Yeah. And we we thought we'd treat our, well, no, we thought we work a lot of hours. And then this guy, he called, he said, do I need to give a two weeks notice if I'm going to Tesla? I said, yes, don't burn your bridges. So he said, okay, gave two weeks notice. About three weeks after that, he started calling me up. And I said, oh, what do you want? <laughs> oh, just want to see if my position is still open <laughs> So, Tesla, yeah, they, they work you hours and man, they, they have like on the assembly line, you have to do a certain step within like two minutes. 
So if you're putting the dash on, you have to you know put it on and blah 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 blah. If you take longer, this red light comes on. If the light keeps going on, the supervisor group will walk over to you and to your station. You know what what you're doing is sort of oversee what's going on. It's really pressured. <laughs> you know something? Why do people do that? Why do you have to run a company that way? It's Musk. Uh, Musk was on the floor a lot. You know, he he was really hands on. Well, but he have you seen have you seen everything like the so you know the Tesla Ys? We got ours for like sixty two thousand. Yeah. They just they just dropped the price about ten thousand now, so they're fifty two thousand for the new ones. Mm -hmm. There's no line to wait for them. They're available, and so all of the used Teslas right now are dropping. <laughs> So I started seeing some twenty uh, nineteens like with twenty thousand miles going for like thirty thousand. It's really really inexpensive for electric car. Really? Do you think the bottom's falling out of Tesla, or or is this just the the bottom's falling out of you know, everything? I I think just that with with lowering the price and all that stuff and like you said, he's in too many things right now. I mean, he needs to focus on a couple of these things. Yeah, I think you should get rid of Tesla and SpaceX and just concentrate on Twitter. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they sold all the pieces. All mm -hmm. the did you see that? What? Like, like you know the the Twitter bird, you know the original one. They sold that. They sold all these little things that were around the the offices. Oh, you know, the, so the Twitter on the building. Like, yeah, the signs, like the signs, and, and like in the hallway, they had like these. Uh, desks that were bicycles, all these stupid things like Google has around the place. And and Musk went in there and started selling everything. They auctioned everything off. Desks that it. are bicycles? They had these little stationary bicycles and, you know, this little artsy fartsy stuff. And you know, he, you know, I, there was something out. I always hated about the new business models. You know, when you have a, a desk that's also a bike, that's going a little far, okay? <laughs> you know, you come to work, work okay and you want to exercise go home and we'll let you off early go to the gym you know or buy your own bike at home but when you come to work sit at that desk and just do the goddamn job yeah you know am i at like google they had they had you know gourmet well they still do they have gourmet oh. chef and and just food galore and those a lot of kids work there, and they're there like 12 hours, but they get fed. And I, I'm not kidding you. When I was working at CNET, <clears throat> which is a story in and of itself, but when I was working at CNET, I had an ad I read. I can't remember what company it was who was hiring people, and it was an ad for, come work for us. We're great to work for. And do you know what they listed as one of the things that was a very important factor in why you should work for them? Dry cleaning on premises. <laughs> yes, we have that. You have that at your place? Yeah, but you have to pay for it. But there's a stall there that you can put your dry cleaning. Oh, and then you can back next week or whatever. But you have to pay. You, for you it. guys are cheap bastards. These guys <laughs> were giving it, doing it for free. Yeah. You know, Google, yeah. Google. When I was there, when Tiffany brought me there one time, they had like it looked like a lunch truck, but it was a haircut. So the truck pulled up. And they opened the doors, and people got in line and got haircuts at, at Google. Really? Yeah. Well, right I mean, it, look, it's nice to have little things, benefits like that. But just to say, you know, we're doing an ad here. We want some high-tech people to come work for us. By the way, we've got dry cleaning on premises. All I could think of was, you know, well, is the CEO, like, running the iron on the, on the dry cleaning? You know? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Just ridiculous, yeah. but you know that's business today. I just I just don't see why, uh, you know. And, and so far as having a you know great chef and things like that, I mean, I went over to uh, Pixar, and they have this wonder. They have this food court, and you're saying, well, you know, maybe maybe Lucas, uh, not Lucas, but uh, Steve Jobs was making a few extra bucks doing that. And uh, the fact of the matter was, the food court's absolutely free. Mm -hmm. Anything in it, you know, you can go over to this part and you can get your hamburgers here, and you go there and get ravioli and you know. But the only reason why I'm not against it uh, terribly is because some of these people do are do work a lot of hours. By mm -hmm. the way, I've got a little chatter going on here. 
Um, let me see here. A, a little kind of noisy chatter, and I can't figure out where it's coming from. Uh, it isn't coming from you, is it? Uh, tr just, uh, Kevin, uh, mute your mic a second. Let's uh, see. I don't think so. You know what? Maybe it is. Let's see. No. Oh, well, wait a minute. Whatever you did. Well, I don't know. I give up. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Weird video thing going on too. What? His video thing. It looks like lines. Oh, oh, that talking. always happens with him at the very beginning. It's like his his. It's the only webcam a cam in America that has to warm up. You know. <laughs> and he gets all these little lines through it's it and so dropping on. in from space. <laughs> yeah. Well, did you turn off your mic there for a second? No, but I can't tell whether I'm muting the web page or not. Well, that always happens. With... Yeah. Okay, it should be muted now. Okay, but I'm still getting a little... Ch there's some kind of chatter thing I'm getting. Let's see here. Who else would it be? Jeff? Um, uh, just mute your, your your mic for a second. Yeah. Or is it muted? O'Brien has muted his. Um, yeah. No? No, it's not Jeff. It's not Brian. It's not Vernon. Charlie, turn yourself off. Oh, no, that's not where it's coming from. Okay, uh, uh, Josh, turn off your mic for a second. And let's see if it stops. That's it. So w whenever you got to talk, just turn your mic on, turn your mic off when it's not. Okay, everybody else can turn their mics back on, okay? Everybody, here we go. Charlie, turn your goddamn mic on. We have Josh Wheeler. Oh, <laughs> keep yours off for a second. And let's see, you know, anytime you want to jump in and uh, tell us something, just uh, be sure to do it. I had a question for you last night, Josh, and I can't remember what it was. Do you remember, Charlie, <laughs> what the question I wanted to ask him was? It, was... it had something to do with uh, the nuclear... Uh, oh, secrets. What kind of uh, uh, things can the president declassify if there were some things he could... Oh, yeah, if a president can just declassify... Um, uh, secrets or classified or top secret or whatever. Can he just do it like that? Or does he have to... Uh, I don't think it's instantaneous. Um, well, I mean, because Trump claimed, oh, I just declassified all that stuff. No, well, that, that, that's, that was nonsense. I mean, I'm not saying for maybe a lot of that he might not have had the right to he probably would have, but he didn't, because if he had, there's a process that would have taken place. Yeah, we were asking about, what well, is there a process? And it, and it didn't take place. And I mean, and like, you know, even if he did, you know, the my understanding was that he was also in possession, I believe, of like the original copies. OK, which automatically means they haven't been declassified in my mind, because the original copy always stays with the intelligence agency, and then once it's declassified, they make a notation on it. Mm -hmm. They literally stamp it declassified, initial it, you know, a few things like that, and then it still stays with them, and then the copies for public record are given out to, you know, areas that can disseminate the information yeah. through Freedom of Information Act or publish them on their website you know, like the State Department or whoever. I mean, I still to this day do research and read classified documents from as far back as the 40s and World War II that literally have a huge declassified stamp in the top right-hand corner for whatever with an initial. I mean, it's been that way for 70 or 80 years. Yeah. So, you know, even if he did do it, which he would have had the right to do a lot of. I mean, that stuff gets pretty complicated because, you know, it's not like a constitutional thing or whatever. It's all governed by federal laws, and, you know, they're pretty complex and all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the president can really tell anyone anything that he wants for the most part. You know, I'm sure there are always exceptions. Yeah, but the, but the, the, question, that I, the question that I had was process. that Trump, Trump said he had declassified all those things before That's, he took them with him. No. Just by thinking That's about it. it. Yeah, well, yeah. well, I mean, these weren't, these were, uh, and you were talking about it, uh, these were not copies. These were yeah. the actual documents.
Right. I mean, let's I mean, face that it. that in itself is a huge, you know, uh, hurdle in his defense of that because that's not – I just know that that's not how the declassification process works. I mean, you know, right. look, I don't work for an intelligence agency or anything. I obviously do not know the answer to all of this, but I do know through historical research – a decent amount about how the archives operates and how documents go through and how you can access them and where they they go to and i'm telling you when they're declassified they are marked as such clearly yeah. every page of every report is i mean not just the front page so in other words if his paper if, 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 been declassified, if they stamp yeah. every page if his documents didn't say declassified on them then they were right correct yeah yeah, I mean, that, then he didn't make it right, and he didn't do the process. As I read when that was happening, I, I read that there's a process for declassification. You have there to go is. to the department where it was classified, and it has to go through whoever classified it to mm -hmm. discuss and, and, you know, give right. a reason why you want it declassified. And then it has to go through a process of that. And then once all that gone through, then it goes <clears> to the <throat> president. And it gets a, there's a process of declassification. It's not just saying, "Oh, poof, it's declassified." In other words, right. just taking them home isn't enough. Right? Oh, hell. <laughs> and I mean, and it's not like the movies. I mean, even if it was, I mean, I'm sure the president does have the right to say, "Hey, you there, you don't have classification to read this, but I need you to do this clandestine operation, and I just gave it to you. Your access is granted." He's got some authority to do that kind of stuff. But that's not the same as declassifying the whole document and being able to go outside and hold it up for the fucking New York Times to take a picture of and publish it the next day. That's totally different. Yeah. You know, than, than looping in an individual for national security reasons for a clear and present danger, which he has the right, you know, almost unlimited to do a lot of things. But as far as just, you know, you know, saying, hey, this document is declassified, you know, the original document that we passed around in a briefing just a few weeks ago. And, um, you know, hey, you, what's your name? Uh, you know, guy who sells the paper on the street corner here, have this fucking document. You know, I mean, that's not how it works. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, there is a process so that even if he does deem it declassified, there are still people that go over it and make sure that every word of it is still good enough to be declassified. I mean, I've seen declassified documents that still might have had like a single name or something, you know, Redacted, uh, yeah. blacked out or, or whatever, yeah. you, know, you know, of like 99.9% .9 of it is, is all there, but there's still maybe a redaction that may never go away because of whatever reason, you know, it might get someone killed or injured or, you know, blow up future ops or whatever. Yeah, but uh, now let me ask you this. Can a president, say J Joe Biden, uh, take mm. classified documents home with him to look them over? Well, I mean, there's some question there. I mean, technically, I don't really think he's supposed to. I mean... I don't know. I'm sure they give them a lot of leeway, like inside the White House, for example. Uh, but honestly, I I've read a lot of information that says they really don't want them taking that stuff to the White House residence and leaving it in their personal study. You know, that, that right, these documents okay. are almost meant to be given to him by someone on the staff. He or she reads it, takes their notes, whatever they want to do, and then they give it back. So that it can be re-secured until the next time they want to look at it. You know, the president carrying it around in his briefcase between his home office and his downstairs study and the oval and all that. Mm -hmm. I don't really think is the procedure. Now, I'm sure if that's as worse as it ever got. It is if you're intending on selling those documents to the Russians. Yeah. Right. No, I yeah. mean, right. I'm sure if that's as worse as it ever became, you know, that... He was, a president was legitimately just carrying them, you know, upstairs to the third floor of the White House where he lives, back down to the Oval. He was working, doing his work. I don't know that anyone is ever going to, like, you know, tackle him on that and be like, you can't do that, you know. But obviously that's not what happened here. That's not what we're talking about, you know. 
I mean, it's two years down the road, and it's still, you know. Well, I love how, I love how Trump is giving him a bad time, saying, "Well, I don't didn't keep mine in a Chevrolet. Oh, my my documents were all in a ve very secure Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, real secure Mar-a-Lago, where anybody can walk in the front door and have a wedding. You know, I mean, uh, and and then he he said, and and you know. The uh, vice president, the president's home is is uh, insecure. If it, it was is, on a wet damp if, floor, if, wet damp floor, wet damp floor. Yeah, he said, but it was also uh, insecure. And my point is, if it's insecure, then the Secret Service isn't doing its job because that thing is probably locked down like a vault. The uh, vice yeah. president's home. Yeah. Well, it's in Annapolis at the Naval Observatory, which in no, no, itself no, no, is no, 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 no. I'm talking about the president. I'm talking about uh, Biden's personal home in Delaware. Oh, in Wilmington. In Wilmington, yeah. Well, they, they guard that 24/7 yeah. when he's not there for that particular. Yeah. I mean, they've always done. But they that. don't guard. They don't guard in quite the same way Mar-a-Lago. They do have a contingent of Secret Service people down there right. to protect him. And why? Because yeah. if he got killed, nobody would care. Well, uh, that's, you, know, you know. I mean, it's, but, you know, in that case, you're talking about a former president versus a sitting president. You know, the level of security is entirely different. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, he still is entitled to his security, but it's not as if they lock it down the same way that they do when you're the sitting president. They're, they're basically for protection. In the case of, of, mm -hmm. of uh, Biden, it's to keep people away and to, yeah, you know, and, and, you know many of the, the security enhancements that they make the president's homes stay after the fact because you know these presidents usually keep those homes you know like george bush still has his ranch in waco or whatever that they added a security perimeter to and a guard shack and all that it's still there you know they don't tear it down just because he's the former president they keep it there because it makes their job of protecting him as the former president easier right yeah so, I mean, it's not like they just tear that stuff down after four years or eight years. I mean, it stays there. Right. So, you know, I mean, there is good security to it. But, you know, I mean, anything that Trump has to say is it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't care if, what he says if about Biden or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then handle business with both of them. I don't care. Yeah. I never said, you know, if Joe Biden broke the law, then yeah. go after it. Get it fixed. You know, right. I mean. Right. But there are different degrees of law breaking. I mean, you know, I think if I don't declare income on a hundred dollars worth of income, mm -hmm. I think that's a little different than hiding a million dollars worth of income. They're both tax evasion, are they not? Yeah. I mean, right by the letter of the law, I evaded taxes on a hundred dollars of income. You evaded taxes on a million dollars of income. We're both guilty of tax evasion, but I do think there's a difference there. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, and and that that's why courts exist to adjudicate these problems. You know, that's why they have juries and that's why they have judges to look at everything on a case by case basis. That's why prosecutors are given, you know, uh, leeway to decide whether or not to charge someone with manslaughter in the second degree mm -hmm. or murder in the second degree, you know, by the evidence and by hearing their story and mitigating factors and you know so on and so forth so anything trump says you know it's a crock of shit yeah 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 uh yes what about yeah. all the documents what about all the documents that were in his ex-wife's coffin on the golf course yeah what right exactly coffin? jeff i'm curious if anybody has considered the factor that we're talking about papers that are signatures and all of that but I would assume the presidents today have a computer. And if the guy's on the second floor, he's probably got a computer there too. Yeah. And he's just, you know, yeah, he's they, got a lot of documents like, that he's got I to mean, read. They, I don't think they digitize much of that stuff, you know. I mean, I do remember, you know, when things went digital a lot during the Obama administration, you know, hearing stuff about how they had got him like a super encrypted phone or whatever that he could do yeah. things with and whatnot. But I do know that they still do documents, you know, on paper. I mean, you know, and, and it's just, and I just know that the process is to take the original, run it through the declassification process, 
stamp it, copy it, file it, put it out. The whole, I mean, the, and none of that happened in this case. I mean, he really has no defense. I, I mean, and look, along the same lines, Joe Biden has little defense. I mean, you know, he was careless with documents. I mean, that, that, I mean, yeah. what am I going to do? Well, make, it's to also, make it sound like he wasn't? He was. You think about it, too, is the government, you know, when these guys are going out of office, you would think that there'd be some kind of a process or some kind of a, you know, vetting process that, that keeps an eye on what people are taking out of the office, you know, at the end of their terms. And, you know, what are you taking out of that, you know, out of the uh, out of the White House? Don't they check that stuff? No. You know? I agree. That's what I think we talked about like a week or two ago where I said, no doubt, you know, that's that, going to happen, obviously. But yeah, regardless of political party kind of and all that, I mean, I don't care who did it or whatever, but it's obvious that government leaders have been careless with highly classified and top secret information. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. Let's, 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 let's move on. To, let's move on to something else here. Uh, today, uh, the uh, the lately the uh, you know this, this, the Republicans in the Senate have, have spent very little time letting their heel their heels cool as it were, and they get they're getting some work done. Like uh, they what was it today or yesterday, uh, they passed a measure to defund the IRS so that they ha they can't go out and bother rich millionaires and billionaires and and harass them for taxes now That's the th house that did that though right the house that did that it's never gonna it's never gonna pass in the senate and even if it did the president would never sign it you know but they're trying to defund the money the irs gets that's a fascia, though. I think they're just trying to make it look like they're doing something. Well, no, I think they actually would like to. You know, th yeah. is there a warning shot across the bow? This is how obnoxious we're going to be for the next two years. You know, and and uh, uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a <clears throat> horrible thing. You know, that they would want to. Huh? They're certainly not getting anything done by doing that. No, it's just no. In fact. They're allowing billionaires and billionaires to get away with fraud. I mean, they're allowing them to just file anything they want to. And uh, according to the Republicans, they don't want them going after them. Well, I don't want them going after me. Why don't you pass something that prevents them from going after me? In fact, okay. let them not go after me because I pay so little compared to what these corporations and billionaires and millionaires should be paying that yeah. uh, you know, I mean, it, the the amount of tax money revenue which is gained by the government from uh, people like you and I is a very minor amount of the money they collect every year. You know, they could stop collecting it from us and just raise it a little bit on the millionaires and billionaires, and we'd be good to go. We'd have all the money we need. So. You know, why are you suddenly saying, well, we got to do it because they're going after, they're unfairly targeting billionaires and millionaires. Well, of course they are, because those are the people who have the most money, you know, and, and sometimes those tax, you know, when you, when you say you've got a company like GE did one year that, uh, that said uh, uh, didn't pay any taxes because they said they didn't, they lost money or something, well, you know, it was ridiculous. Why should GE not pay taxes when you and I do? You know, so, I mean, uh, but uh, their whole idea is, well, let's, let's defund the IRS. Good, good going, guys. Really good going. And they're using, it, they're using that as in that, you know, they're trying to waste money by hiring all those IRS agents, so they're going to save money by not having them there. But then really they're not having them there. Well, they don't audit all the Why did the IRS say that they, they didn't uh, adjudicate uh, Trump's tax returns that well over those years? <laughs> they said they didn't have enough people to do it. Yeah, I mean, this, this time next week, you know, somebody in the Republican leadership will be on television telling you that government doesn't work. If you've ever called the IRS and sat on hold for six hours, you would know that. 
you know, yeah. I mean, that's what they'll be telling you. I mean, yeah. Well, the reason the reason you're waiting for six were, hours on hold is because they only got three people answering the phones. Right. All right. I mean, it's the same way. I mean, they obviously have a problem. I mean, ask any. I talk to people all the time. You know, guys that even work for me that were getting close to retirement that act like it 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 takes forever to get your social security going, even when you turn. 65 and they owe you the money they've known they're going to owe you the money for 65 years and you still have to go through all this crap to start i don't know that it's that horrible i don't know that it's that horrible Uh, but if you need any help at all what they're saying is if you have any question or any you know a confusion or i don't understand how i fill this box out and i just need to ask a simple question it's like a day's worth of work. You know what we need? Answer. What we need is a law. Follow me on this one. We need to have a law that requires simplicity in being able to function online. In other words, if you're a company and you're you're running something where people have to do something, make it easy so that, for instance, a person who's 80 years old and really doesn't know computers that well can navigate with ease what they have to navigate. But I, I'm telling you, Marjorie, and I know computers. Marjorie knows computers. She's worked with them for most of her life, okay? Um, and uh, we, we'll go do something with, oh, I don't know, Social Security, or we'll do something with Medicare, or we'll do something. She was trying to do something the other day with uh, our, 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 what do you call it, insurance, our prescription insurance. And all she wanted to do was be able to get onto my account and find out how much money had been paid towards that, okay, and then uh, hers as well. And then she wanted to be able to have the ability to access my account. Do you know what the, how long that took her to get them to do that? Two hours. Two hours. And it was... And it was this thing, that thing, and all the time, well, I'm going to send you a security code. Do you yeah. remember your password? It, it, <laughs> no, but the two-factor, the two-factor uh, you know, verification. And this, when I heard her, she's sitting next to me. I'm going, what's going on over there? And she says, I've been on for about two hours with these people. Oh. And this was, this was uh, uh, United Health, United Health. Yeah. But I mean, I, I guess it's even worse with like, you know, Social Security or like Medicare. Or, and she had to put me on the phone and have me like say, that. yes, I approve of this. You know, I'm going to do that. OK, we're going to send you a code now. And make sure you're the, I'm going, oh, my God. The, you know. there, there's one gentleman at my work, a supervisor who's trying to retire. And the, just like Josh is saying there, he's having a hell of a time. Every time he's going to them, they they lost something of theirs, and it's been going on. He should have retired like six or eight months ago, and he's. I checked in when I got there today, and I still saw him there. Like, yeah, I mean that's what I'm saying. You know, is I, I mean they just, they'll be wanting like one more document, and it has to be the original, but you don't have it anymore because you're 67 years old, and you're you know. Lost it yeah, but I mean, if, if all I'm saying is there should be some laws requiring <laughs> these companies to have a simplified system, you know? And by the way, this two-factor identification and verification, if I don't want it, then I shouldn't have to do it. You should, you know, I go, no, that's okay. You don't have to send me a number. You, gotta, you, you. Oh, no, we have to make sure it's you. Well, you know... Hmm. I could be somebody else sitting at Bennett Schwarzman's computer right now and getting his email coming up, and I'll, I'll get the two-factor the two-factor verification, and then I'll spit it back to you. And I'm not even Alex Bennett. You don't know that, you know? Yeah, I mean, like I said, my my previous employer made you do that when you were on their company computer in the company's building on the company's internet. And they still had to text you something after you had already signed into your own computer with your own unique credentials, by the way. And you still had to do that to get to certain applications. And I want to know if any of this really helps them do away with fraud. You know, I mean, I just I, I but all I'm saying is 
if you're just an older person and you don't know much about computers, you know how to send a letter or do an email or whatever, but then you've got to negotiate this thing, it's not easy. You know, mm -hmm. it's a real pain in the ass. And uh, uh, if I can't figure it out, you know, I'm sitting here going, mm, God, what do I, which one do I click here? What, you know? I mean, I even went to the bank today to get out some money. I like to go to the Bank of America because I can get $100 bills, right? So I go to the, the ATM machine, and I go through all the stuff, and then it says, uh, how do you want it? And I said, well, I want it in mixed bills, okay? Well, usually when I say that, what comes up is a thing that allows me to say, give me five 20s, give me three $100 bills, Okay. Today, it says when I hit mixed, it just spit it out what they wanted to spit out to me, which was two $100 bills and, you know, um, 10 20s. Um, but that's not what I wanted. I mean, it, 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 things should be easier. They should not be complicated. And they shouldn't ask you a series of questions. Oh, and then do you want this? But do you want that? Would you like to have this? Would you like to have that? No, I just want my money, okay? Give me, you know, three $100 bills and, you know, five 20s. Right. I, I mean, I don't go to BP gas stations because you usually have to answer like four or five questions before you can actually pump fucking gas. You know, like, really? Do you want a receipt? Do you want a fucking car wash? Do you have a fucking rewards card? Like, no, I just want fucking gas. <laughs> That's well, you, it. well, you should be wanting to buy the gas, and after the fact, while you're pumping gas, it should ask you maybe those questions. But if you don't answer them, you still get the goddamn gas. It's just like, it just aggravates the fuck out of me. I mean, you know, like subway, I, subways, they constantly asking you questions. Like, just fucking make a fucking sandwich. I don't know. What did you say, subways? Yeah, Subway, the food place. The sub always, place? They ask you those oh, questions? Do you want this? Do you want this? They got so many fucking questions. It's like, I was, let me tell you what I fucking want. You know, I mean, they just, I don't know. I'll tell you, I was walking out it's of like Best Buy. that everywhere now. There's all these. It's, many the years, many years ago, out. one of many years ago, when I came back to New York, I went down to, um, uh, where do you call it? Uh, Best Buy to buy a TV set, right? And I wanted to pay cash. Have you ever tried to pay cash at Best Buy? I mean, on a, on a higher ticket item, like a $700 item? Wait a minute, let me get my manager. Hey, this is cash, okay? This is cash. Don't you have that little, little pen you can put on each bill to make sure it's not counterfeit? Yeah, this, is ca this is cash. You don't, want, you don't take cash here? Well, I have to find out if we do. I mean, and then, and then, oh, like as, I, as I'm walking to the cash register, the guy's going, listen, would you, you know, these sets break down very easily. Would you like to get the warranty? Would you like our geek service or whatever? And I'm going, no. And then they, they try, then, then they try to sell me something else and something else. Fine. I said to him, I said, yeah. you try to sell me one more thing before I leave here and I'm not buying it. Okay. There are some places now that don't take cash anymore. Oh, really? All. Like, I don't know what, what, what so I asked Kevin, but like at, at, at Paycor Stadium, when you go to the Bengals game, it's no cash. Okay. Hey guys, it's no cash. No well, cash. You have to pay. Well, then you, you have to even, the, even like the uh, vending guys that walk up and down the steps and all that. Yep. Selling beer. It's, yeah, they have a machine. Cash. It's yeah. only, it's all <laughs> cashes. Well, I suppose I went to the game with a, with a, with a, with a credit card I stole. Yeah. You have to, if you go with cash, you have to go over to the fucking machine and turn your cash into a card and buy a, a card and buy like a cash payment card. Yeah, you can't really? use cash at pay anymore. <clears throat> well, yes, Alan. That was just last year. Yes, so I'm pretty I'm sure that you. I'm pretty sure that you can't do it at the baseball stadium either. Mm. Um, and like, since I'm a season ticket holder, I have an app they put on my phone where I can just deposit money into an account. Yeah, and I just pull yeah. it up and it scans the barcode. I mean, but but if you just want one drink for six fifty, you cannot give them six dollars and fifty cents. They will. They don't even have cash. Not getting your fucking drink until you fucking get something. Other than well, when they were a dollar, maybe they would. But <laughs> you know, well, not anymore. Well, that means you don't get no fucking tip either. <laughs> yeah. What are you gonna say, yeah. Alan? So I like I like it when you take a hundred dollar bill in 
and they take that two dollar pin to see if the hundred dollar bill is real. Yeah. I you know yeah. <laughs> but all you gotta do is spray your dollar bills with hairspray and fake fake dollars, fake hundred dollar bills, and the pin will say that it's good. But I, I don't like it when reacts with, it reacts it reacts <clears throat> with a certain um Well I'm glad you're telling it. everybody in our audience how to commit fraud. Absolutely. Yeah. We're all honest. Here. Yeah. But I'm yeah. running some more no right now listening. on the copy machine. <laughs> but when gas was a hundred dollars, I tried to pay with the hundred dollar bill and I said oh, we don't accept hundreds. I said you just charged me a hundred and one dollar on the pump. How can I can't use a hundred dollar bill? Yeah. Why can't why can't you take it? Yeah. Well, you got to keep in mind one thing, Alex. What? Most most clerical people are not the brightest people in the world. And they also will steal. So a lot of companies are getting away from accepting cash for that reason because who's to say that that cashier when you turn your back sticks it in their own pocket. Well, that's well, one thing, but the other thing is is that the most what do you do you know what the most commonly uh, uh, counterfeited bill is? 20 20, 20, 50, 20, 20, 20, yeah. And and yet they don't really counterfeit hundreds because they will be more scrutinizing of a hundred dollar bill than they will of a 20. So really you should want to take hundreds, you know, because they're not going to, they're probably not going to be counterfeit, especially if you do whatever checks you have to do to make sure that it isn't, you know. But it, I, it just kind of, I don't know, in a way it makes me feel like I'm being treated as a criminal when I go up to the, uh, the checkout stand and I give the guy uh, a $20 bill and then he holds it up to the light. Yeah. You know, I just feel like, I don't know, I, 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 I'm, I'm some kind of de facto I criminal. I printed it, be careful, the ink will come off. Yes, That's exactly. what I did too. <laughs> Ryan Zegman is here, ladies and gentlemen. Right. And uh, he is uh, right there uh, somewhere near uh, Brian Neary. So we have the two Brians tonight. Well, it, Brian with an I and Brian see, with a Y. Where is he online? They both are getting married soon, aren't they? Who? Uh, oh, Brian Sigmund is getting married. Right. Brian Neary is not. Are you, Brian? Oh, he's down. Yeah, 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 yeah he's down. Right. Uh, I don't know. We're trying to negotiate all the tax money back and the kids' money stuff, so we're trying to negotiate. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Wait a minute. <laughs> what, 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 what do you have to negotiate? <laughs> she, she gets a lot of money for her for the kids, so. Oh, from an ex? No, yeah, from from a bunch of stuff, so. And yeah, if you so. get married, she loses that money? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, so. Oh. So we're negotiating right now. So we'll, I'll let you guys know later. Uh, well, you, well, good news for you. She's marrying me, Brian. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, I can Yeah. So you'll oh, get right. it. Probably second 20s. Yeah. I don't understand how you can refuse to take. It says on the dollar bill, it says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. So how can they <laughs> refuse to take this for payment? Well, well it, it, what they have to do is, I guess they have to pass a law now saying you must take cash if people want to pay cash. It says it on the bill. Yeah. I always pay my hookers with cash. Yeah, of course. <laughs> they don't I, wonder if, I wonder if private... What, you don't use Venmo? <laughs> <laughs> Too complicated right. for That's me. Traceability, don't want that cash just clean. <laughs> yeah. Not from experience, I heard from a friend. Uh -huh. yeah, okay. Dear, I was just checking the Venmo bill, <laughs> and I noticed something here for a thing called uh, in-call services. From Cinnamon. <laughs> from Cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> Must be fraud, honey. Yeah. I'll straighten yeah. it out. Uh, oh, my. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing, just amazing. But it's just, I, I just don't, uh, you know, I'm sorry. It's not, and it's, I'm not complaining because in most cases I can navigate this stuff, but it's still getting harder for me. And if it's hard for me, how is it for other people my age? How is it for some of you? I mean, I'm sure some of you hit the internet and you try dealing with this stuff and you can't figure out what you're supposed to fill out and not fill out. And then you, my, Marjorie the other day, here's the one. 
we get these uh, these uh, sugar-free Hall's cough drops. I get them because I got a little tickle in my throat, and she gets them because uh, <coughs> she she literally sleeps with one in her mouth now, so she doesn't have problems with her mouth getting too dry and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we get them sugar-free because you know who wants to rot your teeth with a cough drop? All right, so so we got these right. And um, she orders, she goes on to Amazon. And what do you do with Amazon? You want more. And you ordered them once before. And they say, you ordered this once before. Do you want to reorder? You go, yes. She clicked reorder. They sent us two giant boxes, like 24 packets in each box, right? Which is what she ordered. But they weren't sugar-free. Oh. Oh. <sighs> Send them back. Well, no, of course. She called them up and said, this is what happened. And she said, you want me to send them back? And they said, no, you can keep them. You can either throw them away or give them to charity or you know, give them to some poor people. Mm -hmm. Crazy world. So now, you know, all the people under my building's uh, covering that they have up here, we call it a, 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 a homeless shelter. Uh, we're just going to pass it out to them. So they, they, don't, they, get, they don't get a cost. Window, they fall down near eight flights or whatever? <laughs> yeah, no, the trouble is, <laughs> if, the if I throw them out my window, they're just going to wind up on this platform that's about a floor yeah, above up. the ground, see? The scaffold. The scaffold. Um, the only thing <laughs> that scaffold was good for, uh, and I hope they better clean this before they're through with everything, some graffiti artist got up there at night because the platform was up there and put a nice big giant piece of graffiti on the side of our building. Nice. Also, you know, I hope they clean it before they leave. I mean, it's, I, I think they painted it in anticipation of Jeff and Pam coming. Well, it says Jeff and Pam mm -hmm. up there. In fact, I think maybe it was Jeff who did the tagging. Ah. Well, yeah. well, I'll bring a, a big hose. We can wash it down. A big hose, yeah. And then they're bringing up these bricks every day and these cement bags, and they bring them up in our elevator. Now our elevator floor, which wasn't too pretty to begin with, is now coated with cement dust. Ugh. I mean, it's just, it's just. I feel like I'm, I'm living in a slum here. I, yeah. That's amateur hour. No, it's more I know it's amateur hour. For, well, you yeah, did you say? You, the whole they, they sell a saran wrap nice. that goes on the carpet, yeah, like because it's like all no problem. carpet. We but the floor is a, is a, a mosaic tiles. Uh, yeah, well, they yeah, got that too, Alex. Mosaic tiles, and yes, they should be putting down uh, a plastic yeah. f thing. They're putting plastic over the windows now. They weren't doing that when they started the job, yeah. but they are now, and they're sealing off the windows. With with plastic, somebody uh, else in the building probably threatened to sue him. Yeah, I bet it got complaint. Yeah, well, some other Well, well yeah. I'm I'm starting to you know I've been having this this respiratory problem and it's because of the stuff in this building. When we go to the weekends and they're not here, maybe it's raining or whatever. And my I breathe better. Wouldn't yeah. it be funny if the cough drops you were taking was causing you the it, problem? Probably, probably, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a cough drop, mm -hmm. so it's meant to make you cough. Right? Anyway. So where, uh, let's see, what else? Oh, yes. I've been, uh, Jeff. I'm doing some uh, fixing in, in our house. And we get some people coming in to do some of the work. Mm -hmm. And these guys are terrific. They always bring big sheets so that mm -hmm. as they're walking by, they're yeah. not getting the yeah. house dirt. And then every day they take the stuff away whatever they've done outside. They do a lot of mm -hmm. cutting outside. And they go look at the grass, they clean that up every day. It's pretty good. I want to ask, yep. yeah, I want to ask another question here. Um, sure. Because Lisa Marie Presley died uh, in the last week. Mm -hmm. And it, it's taken them a week to bury her because they're goyim. And uh, because Jews bury their dead within two days. That's the joke, mm -hmm. see. Uh, but the uh, <laughs> no Kevin like that. I heard that. Yeah. No, there was a Lenny Bruce uh, a bit once that Lenny did about the fact that uh, uh, he he uh, oh yeah that he had a tattoo, and his grandmother said, "Oh my God, you know, 
You, you, you can't be buried can't in the Jewish buried. cemetery, you know. <laughs> He says, well, then I'll have to be buried in a Gentile cemetery because I guess they'll bury anybody. <laughs> but anyway, um, um, so there's all this stuff. They now bring back Elvis Presley. You know, like to begin with, Lisa Marie was the one that found him dead on the toilet. Okay. Uh, and uh, her life wasn't appreciably made better except for, because of the money uh, by, by her father being Elvis Presley. Uh, and I stopped thinking about it, and I'm going, I never liked Elvis Presley. He, he, I, anybody here a fan of Elvis Presley? You were, Charlie? My whole life. He's the king. <laughs> really? Really. All my whole community. We used to, every one of those Elvis movies, when they came out, we were wait, all wait, 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 there. Wait a minute, hold they on a second. They were dancing in the theater. Let, 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 first of all, those were some of the most terrible movies made in Hollywood I don't history. Care. We loved them. They were. I mean, Elvis goes to Hawaii. There are, Elvis goes to no, Chicago. there are few, few things like uh, Jailhouse Rock, and um, 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 <laughs> uh, what was it? There was one other. Um, oh, Viva, Viva Las, Las Vegas. Vegas, and that's kind of corny, but it's fun. Okay, but the rest of them really sucked. Okay, matter of opinion. Well, and, wait a minute, and, and and he didn't after he the first sun sessions, and a couple of the first sessions at RCA, everything else he did sucked. Am I anybody disagree with me Alex, on this one besides Charlie? Yes, I Brian. Alex, Alex uh, Charlie and I we stand shoulder to shoulder. Um, I, I think you need to know that he's an icon. And ever since Forrest Gump told him how to dance, um, <laughs> he, he, he he tore the world in half. You know, and the guy's an icon. He stole music from the best of them. But yeah. I think I, I truly believe he was authentic in such a way that, you know, he was like the Pat Boone. He was like a rocks, but he was a rock star version. No, nobody's like Pat Boone because nobody's that yeah. mediocre. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. you know all those black artists that couldn't make money, but then they, the white artists. Uh, the best, you. best thing that, that that Pat Boone ever did is when he decided to do Fats Domino's "Ain't That a Shame," <laughs> and he didn't like the way the language was being portrayed, and he sang it as "Isn't that a shame?" <laughs> so that's that's Pat Boone. Uh, but uh, that, that man, yeah, I mean. That's coming from a guy who's... But, but Elvis, Elvis, like you know, Elvis in the beginning did some great stuff on Sun Records. My Baby, you know, My Baby Left Me. Great song. One of the great mm -hmm. rock and roll songs. But once Those you got over... But, you know, yeah. then when you go get over to, to RCA and all that horrible crap from the... Every album he turned out was from a movie. You know? I, I implore anybody here to um, look up the letter that he wrote to Richard Nixon and then look up what he did when he, when he smuggled that re revolver into the white house and all that stuff mm -hmm. like Elvis Elvis he could be a dick but couldn't we all I don't know no I, I'm not I saying that he was a dick he could have been the most wonderful guy in the but world he was a dick. you know he was a dick you yeah. <laughs> know I heard rumors that he used to, because because you got into karate, that he used to beat up his help at the house. But I don't know. There's something about. I know. I, you know, funny. there's I, a rule. There's a rule in show business. Don't beat up the help. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I I I on one hand I could talk more shit on Elvis than anybody, but on the other hand, like I just see him as an icon. Like, he's just like, I mean, some of the songs, I'm telling you, they'll bring you to tears. He, he's got a lot, man. I don't know. Like, you can't talk shit on Elvis. You know. I can talk <laughs> shit on Elvis. You sure can. <clears throat> I, but, and I, I, I just, I just, I, I never really was crazy about him. The reason is when I was growing up and I was that age, you know, I was in my 15, 16, 17, around in there. Um, I didn't listen to Elvis Presley. I listened to all the black performers like Fats Domino, Little Richard, uh, mm -hmm. Chuck Berry, well, who, is, who who wrote the book on how to do rock and roll. You oh, know, great. I mean, so I I always thought Elvis was just this white ripoff artist. You know, or the, 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 the avenue to, yeah. 
or the avenue to bubble everything up to the surface. I mean, like, you got to think of the times, too, man. I mean, the times did not call for Little Richard. But who would who brought Little Richard up? Well, little no, little so, Little Richard did fine on his own. He came up about that time too. Mm-hmm. But I preferred yeah, the black yeah, artists. I, I preferred the black artists. You know, uh, Jeff had his hand up. What did you want? to Yeah, say I just happen to be uh, listening uh, a lot for Elvis just a couple of days ago, and I don't know. I just turned it on on. Uh, on series, okay? Mm-hmm. And I started listening to him again because I haven't, I haven't thought about him for, I don't know, what is it, 50 years or something like that. I turned it off, and a couple of them were okay, and then the rest of them were, were crappy. Yeah, and I just well, I just turned well, it off. I don't know what was worse. What, what what was I don't know what was worse that you were listening to Elvis Presley or that you were listening to Sirius. <laughs> well, I mean, it could be that, but but yeah. I was trying to filter through that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're probably but, doing their Elvis. Uh, uh, it, Lisa Marie Presley dies, so they play all Elvis. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, why that's you, all. Why don't you play Elvis? all Lisa Marie? She made a lot of records. You know? Oh, did she? Yeah. Three. I think only three. Three? three. Well, that's some, um, you know. More than me. Hmm? More than me. I think it's about the same output as Nancy Sinatra, so, you know, I mean, come on. <laughs> about Gary that's Lewis and the Playboys. Gary, yeah. Gary Lewis and the Playboys, yeah. Yeah. Oh. They had, well, they had about, believe it or not, they had about five or six hits. And you know who produced, you know who produced them? Daddy. Leon Russell. Uh, yeah, yeah, they were they were you know I mean those was, those was, was good solid hits you know. Uh, I mean the, James and the Shondells put out like three albums and that was some of the best music ever written. Really, I can't remember what was one of their songs. Oh, Crimson and Clover. Oh, good. Just, oh, come on, <laughs> come on. It's a matter of taste, what about, Alex. What it's about David Crosby taste. who just passed away? Right? Well, not David Crosby. <laughs> Uh, um, Very harmonizing, you know, even talented. Did you ever hear them? But go listen to them singing at Woodstock. Mm -hmm. They're horrible. Mm -hmm. Just horrible. They were pretty fucked up there. Yeah. 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 I remember, I think, Alex, I I think I remember you used to make fun of him when he got busted for cocaine when you're on Live 105 because he was so fat. Well, I used you to say did, you, didn't dis- you didn't respect him because he well, had that that, that, that that made for the old joke the comedian comedians used to use which what's he cutting his coke with butter <laughs> you know and and my friend Larry Bubbles Brown suddenly would just do the punchline to the joke on stage and go butter butter <laughs> 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 Okay. Yeah, but that was. Uh, but anyway, we yeah we did lose uh, we did lose uh, David Crosby. Um, but father, it was some pretty good good music. Good father to uh, Drew Barrymore too. What? Yeah, mm-hmm. she was. She was. Uh, he took her under his wing for quite a while when she was all fucked oh, up. Oh really? Oh good. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. Well, he was supposed to be a pretty good guy. Anyway, I can't remember if I ever interviewed him or not. I may have. I can't remember. See. I think the, so. the woman from Jeff Jefferson Airplane uh, was impregnated by him, I believe. No. No. Not Grace Slick. No. No. It wasn't? No. No, it was yeah. uh, Lisa Meth- M- Melissa Etheridge. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Melissa yeah. Etheridge. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. Hey, we run out of time. Thank you for joining us, Ray. <laughs> Ray, what? Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Fine. Thank you, Charlie. Absolutely. Thank you, Vernon. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, uh, uh, Brian. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, uh, Alan. Uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Brian. And thank you, Ray. In fact, thanks to all of you. Why don't you give a big wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye at you, okay? There they go, folks. That's our citizen panel for tonight. There they go. Anyway, that's our uh, citizen panel. Uh, there'll be another one uh, forming right now, like, uh, I don't know, cheese on onion soup. But 
I uh, forget it. I'm in my elderly years now. I can't come up with jokes just like that. Anyway, uh, we're uh, we're off until uh, Monday when we will have the uh, uh, the uh, uh, pop up show, uh, and that'll be on Facebook, by the way. And and then uh, also we'll be back here again. Well, I'll say that in a second. Jack Bishop is next. He's here with the intersection. You can call him on Skype using the address Gabnet Live. I will see you again also here on Wednesday at 10.30, same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Bye-bye, everybody. Have a nice weekend.